Garen Hess, founder and CEO of Consensus, all the way from Utah. Thanks for coming on the CRM Sushi Podcast, man. How the heck are you? Hey, doing great, Wes. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's uh, great to talk with you. Well, I am ready. I see this drive agreement, drive sales. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> well, that's what we're going to talk about today. It's, uh, in Are short, you saying we can get consensus and actually make money? <laughs> that's right. That's the goal, right? All right. So, sign me up. Where, let's just end this right now. Where do I sign? Where do I sign? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, group buying dysfunction is, is the uh, big problem that we're solving. We'll, we'll dive into uh -huh. that. I like that phrase, group buying dysfunction. All right. That is kind of true because you see it all the time. People can't make a decision. So, Exactly. That's the challenge. If you've ever tried to even go to lunch in a group and have to try to decide <laughs> what restaurant to go to, you know how difficult group decision making is. Yep. And, uh, trying to get them to buy off in a large technology platform or any kind of large B2B purchase uh, is infinitely more difficult. And more often than not, they choose not to, not because it's in the best interest of their company, but because of, again, what we call a group buying dysfunction. Well, the old saying that a, a confused mind says no, right? That's right. Yep. So it's safer to say I, no and just, you know, what, what is it? You know, it's better the, the devil you know than the devil you don't know. So they just, they just sit there in their inefficiencies, huh? That's right. It's, it's a quest to decide whether the status quo is better than the new thing. And more often than not, People in general or in groups in any case because of sort of herd mentality and other kinds of pressures, they will choose the status quo because it becomes uh, too risky. Right. Uh, so that's what we're all about is helping to drive agreement in and across all the stakeholders in the buying group for the sales team. And we do that through intelligent, personalized uh, demo automation. Oh, okay. So uh, before we turn this on, you said you were, uh, you were a little rusty on your demos because of the automation. So um, <laughs> thanks for, uh, for shaking off the rust. But then, of course, we, we want to see the automation as well. So Yeah, uh, absolutely. We'll do that. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of funny because we just don't do that many demos of our product mm -hmm. because it's all automated. We do, of course, have conversations in sales and uh, but the whole goal here is to accelerate those conversations and to create opportunities for the different stakeholders in the buying group to engage a lot earlier in the sales cycle and drive analytics back to the sales team and actual, actually also to the internal champion. So I'm excited to share it with you. Sure. I'm looking forward to it. Let's dive in. Okay. Sounds good. Well, um, so I'm just going to go through here. You can find me on Twitter at Garen underscore Hess. And again, the main thing that we're solving here at Consensus is that we help organizations make better decisions faster. And we're talking about your prospects organizations that as a B2B salesperson or sales team, you're reaching out to. So I want to start by just going over a basic scenario here. So this happens all the time in B2B sales. At some point, you're going to have the conversation and the sales rep might say, is there anything else you need before making a decision? And your prospect or internal champion says, you know, I really like what you have to offer, but I need to check with my team and get back to you. And, and that's always what we consider kind of the wall of death because right. you don't have any visibility into what they're doing and the, even the best sales reps struggle with this. And, and research actually shows that only 28% of B2B sales reps know how to deal with this particular challenge. And so it's a large majority of, of account executives out there that aren't effective at driving agreement or consensus across the buying group. Right. And so, you know, they typically say, okay, I'll follow up in the next meeting or next week and see how it's going, or let's get something on the calendar and check in. And that really isn't very effective. You know, is this something that you've seen uh, in your own experience, Wes? Hey, this is why I'm in business. So I, I can't show this to anybody because now no one will use my sales training because this will just <laughs> take away. You're making me redundant and unnecessary. I, I don't know. We've got to hit the lead. Everybody stop watching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, this, I, this, is, uh, this is literally why I got into sale, or sales training, right? Is yeah. how to take this objection away because it, it's a stall, right? Or it may be legit, but they didn't ask the question ahead of time. Hey, who besides you, you know? Uh, cares about this, right? When you're considering a new hardware, software, 
team, blah, blah, blah. You know, who besides you, you know, you bounce ideas off of or engage in the process and bring them in early. So um, you, you got to cut that off at the pass, right? And most people don't. So, yeah, and there are there are lots of different ways to try to tackle this. Um, and as I mentioned, only a small percentage of sales reps know how to do it or do it right. effectively. But even when they do it, it takes a long time because you've got to set up meeting after meeting and you've got to try to personalize your pitch to each new entrant in the buying group that, that shows up. Right. So um, before I jump into this, I want to just talk about um, – more about this concept of group buying dysfunction. And there's a firm in Washington, DC called, um, let me back up here, I'm hitting a, so something's going on here with my slide deck. It's just it's like it's advancing slowly, there you yeah. go. Okay, well we're just gonna. Or you, you can just hit escape and just show that one slide. Yeah, let me just there do that. Yeah. yeah. Not sure what's going on with my transitions there, but basically CEB is the corporate executive board in Washington, D.C., their big primary research um, and uh, consulting firm, and they wrote a book called The Challenger Customer um, a couple of years ago, and they said the biggest challenge that salespeople face isn't improving their ability to sell, but helping customers overcome their ability to reach agreement, and this is, this is at the fundamental core of what we believe. I often say there's no such thing as a complex sale and a lot of experienced account executives are going yeah what do you what do you know that doesn't make any sense I have complex sales all the time and my point is I say no there's only a complex purchase and <laughs> they say oh yeah well you're just you know it's just two sides of the same coin and and my point is that if you don't think of it as a complex purchase and you think of it as a complex sale you will end up thinking about what you need to do to try to drive the sale when in reality it's more about what does the buyer need to do right, to right. get agreement in there among their stakeholders. Yep. So um, let me see if I can get these uh, slides to advance properly here. So before I jump into some of the specifics, I just want to point out um, that our customers are often getting increased close rates north of 40%. Um, and the reason for that is because of this research that CEB um, and Harvard Business Review did. And, and if you look at, they, they studied 5,000 purchase decisions and they looked at due diligence and getting to the customer decision. Early in the due diligence cycle, uh, the internal team starts to look at uh, what they need to learn about the potential solution and understand and explore. And, and they usually get multiple people involved long before they get into a conversation with sales. So about 37% of the way through the purchasing decision, the group is conflicted. They've already reached disagreement and difficulty about whether they should purchase. And the big push and pull is whether or not they should stick with the status quo or choose something different, something that might be better. And so that kind of uh, group buying dysfunction starts very early and then later in the cycle they're evaluating options and making a decision but they don't meet with sales until about 57 percent of the way through the buying group and again you may have seen this research it's, it's not our research or anything but it's it's been out there but this research is key to um, to understanding how our particular solution helps solve the problem of, of this group buying dysfunction right so Another related piece to this is in the same research, they found that every time you add one additional purchaser, the likelihood of purchase drops dramatically. So you can see between the first person and the second person coming in, it drops from 81% to 55%. That's a 25, 26% percentage point drop. And by the time you get down to five or six, which is where the average buying group size is, according to the study, you've, you've dropped another 25%. So there's a 50 percentage point gap that is in the likelihood to purchase this dropping because the buying group gets involved. Right. right. So another way to think about this is when you go out to sell, you're doing your pitch, you engage and, and very well with the prospect, prospect's very interested, 
and then they have to go out and engage the rest of their buying group, and that's where it all falls apart. And according to this research in the book, The Challenger Customer, 80% of buyers want more support, and that's not support for themselves, but support in figuring out how to sell to the rest of the internal team. So who's really doing the selling here? It's not so much the sales rep as it is the internal champion that's selling to the rest of the internal team. Yeah. And they're often left without very many resources to help them do that effectively. Yeah, I remember when I learned that years ago in um – uh, golly, it may have been like in spin selling or one of those. I had some good mentors early on, but you know, I realized that 95% of the sale happens when you're not there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, even if we had a day long meeting, I mean, I'm not there the other 364 days of the year. And so right. how are, how are you, you know, so the old, you got to find a coach or a proponent or a sponsor or a cheerleader. I mean, whatever phrases, you know, the next right. book says, but yeah, having somebody internal that says, we got to move in this direction. Right. And, and the challenge is even when you find that person, they don't know how to handle all the objections. They don't know how to pitch to each stakeholder in the right. buying in a way that's personalized to that person. They just don't, aren't equipped really to deal with it. It's the and, telephone game, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think this better. thing can uh, it'll get us more leads. Oh, they say it could get more leads and more sales. Oh, this thing says yeah, it can get more leads, more sales, and, and, and make us a million dollars. Okay, we'll buy. What do you mean? It doesn't make us a million dollars? Yeah, and more often than not, your, your internal champion or sponsor, they're going to go and they're going to get massacred because they're completely unprepared. They right. go in all enthusiastic. And how many times have they gone away and say, hey, I'm going to go talk to my boss. And then they come back and they're like, I have 35 questions that I didn't know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so what we're doing is we're equipping that internal champion with the necessary tools to go and sell internally. Sure. And so what it looks like now is the sales rep then engages with that prospect through a, an automated personalized demo that's made up of of different video segments and documents that all dynamically organize themselves based on each prospect and each stakeholder's unique interests. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. And then that prospect can go share that same demo with the different stakeholders in the buying group. And because it dynamically personalizes to each stakeholder, then the prospect doesn't have to do it. And they and, and that your your automated demo is pitching for you as if you were as if you were there. It's your surrogate essentially as the sales rep inside the organization. Since to your point, you can't be there 365 days a year. Right. So what's interesting is I want to pause and just mention the word demo. We use the word demo a lot, and sometimes people get hung up on that because there's a lot of argument and, and rightly so in sales about should you demo right away? Should you wait until after you've done your your needs analysis and, and all of that and, and trying to build value in other ways and then demonstrate? But um, I just want to emphasize that when we think of the word demo, we think of client education in almost every aspect. And so Peter Cohen um, of, of Great Demo, he wrote this book called Great Demo, um, and just want to give him a shout out. He's, he's an excellent consultant inside the the uh, B2B sales engineering space. And what he talked about was having two types of demos, a vision demo, which is just a, a way for people to understand what's possible with your product or solution. And then the technical demo, which is, you know, how does that actually work? And so uh, we would actually say that, that you might even expand that into three or four different types of demo demos, the vision demo of, of again, what's possible and then we would say a more in-depth demo, which we call a qualifying demo, and then the technical demo. And then you might even have closing demos. And, and again, this may seem like a lot of different demos, but when you can automate them, uh, it really can uh, help dramatically. So I don't want people to get stuck on the word demo. We've had people say, oh, well, I, you know, I don't want to use a solution because you guys want to just send a demo right away. Well, it's not the technical demo that maybe you're thinking of when we use the word demo. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I do like the four stages because uh, that really makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's uh, really effective when you can present them with something that they can internalize on their own, that personalizes to their unique interests, and they can share it with those stakeholders, and it does the same for them. So, well, pl plus, new questions and concerns come up the farther along you get. You know, just right. before they're ready to buy, something's going to pop up, and so. Um, 
I like that it's personalized because it has to be. And you're right, the more that people come in, some are very analytical, some are very, some are very technical, you know, some are just goal oriented, like let's just get this done. So um, you got to massage all that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, one way to think about what we do is to kind of ask this question, you know, who's more important in getting the sale? Is it, is it you as the AE or is it the internal champion? Right. And I don't know if there's a, you know, straight answer on that, but in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter what we do as, as salespeople, if the internal champion doesn't know what they're doing, right? right? We can be the best salesperson in the world, have the best skills, all the experience, know our product inside and out, and, 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 and know how to, how to best be consultative. And if the internal champion doesn't know what to do or how to do it, it the, the deal's blown. Yeah. So... One way that we like to encourage salespeople to think is that they are, instead of salespeople, they're buying coaches. They understand the way their customers buy because they've, they've gone through a thousand purchasing cycles. You think about the buyer, they're buying your solution. They've never done it before. Um, and so they don't know the right way to buy it or the right way to explore it. You're the expert as the, uh, again, the salesperson or, or the buying coach. So those are two important things I, I think that are different ways for, for account executives to think about it and sales leaders is making sure that uh, we think of it as I'm the buying coach, my prospects, the salesperson, I'm going to coach them and help them through the selling process and how they should buy. Um, so how do they sell to their internal team? And then how do they purchase as a, as a group? How do they get to agreement? Yep. Makes sense. So let's take a look now at um, exactly how this works. So I'm just going to jump out to, to this little uh, sample here. And now can customers set this up on their own or is there like some coaching from your team that helps them set up their demos? Yeah, they can, they can set it up on their own. We have a strong client success team. We have video creation tools right in the platform, but it's so easy to set these things up. Um, the, the challenge is getting the content itself, um, some of the videos done. Um, but a lot of customers already have content and we can talk a little bit more, more about that. But the point is that once you have your content pieces together, putting it together and making this interactive personalized demo, um, that works on desktop browsers and mobile devices, it requires no programming. It's just a simple wizard to go through and you set your options and it, and it's right. all set up. Right. So, uh, this is just a simple example of what we call the standard personalization demo, which usually starts with some kind of intro video and uh, I just have these sample videos in here just to kind of show the the simple process and then it jumps to this question and the intro video is really just a, a brief video that should be a minute or less that basically says here's why we exist here's the big problem we're solving now oh so the customer sees this and they pick yeah I want to see number one not number two and maybe that's right and it's, and it's not just what do I want to see, but how important is it? So let's right, say that, right. you know, the first feature or topic or benefit, again, it doesn't have to be feature related. This is just client education. Let's say, they, oh, this is somewhat important. This feature two is very important. And this last one is not important. You are going to put me out of a job. <laughs> we must end this interview. No one should watch this. <laughs> so, so let me pause. Let me pause. <laughs> Sometimes we get that very reaction from sales reps. They're like, what? You're trying to automate my job. And you know, the point is that if you, can, if you can do this effectively and automate it, what it means is you can have more conversations where you're actually closing deals right. rather than just educating the customer. And you yep. can drill down on what's most important to them having already discovered what's driving their interests. Yep. So in this case, what's going to happen is behind the scenes, there are different video clips and documents and consensus is going to lead with what's very important, and it's also actually gonna grab content that's more in depth, because the stuff is very important to them, they wanna spend a little more time on. Then the things that are somewhat important, it's just gonna grab a summary video clip, and then if it's not important, it's going to just skip it. So if mm -hmm. I click continue, we should see the feature number two start first with a longer, more in-depth topic clip, and then it should go to feature one, and then it should skip three altogether. So you click continue, and you'll see it's just starting 
again, this, what we call a long video, but right. this is just to illustrate kind of the platform. So the long video is playing and it's automatically progressing. Now it's going to feature one and it's loading the shorter video. Notice down at the bottom, it's also showing the total amount of time. So at any time, the prospect is understanding how much uh, content there is that they're going through. Right. And, but as you can see, this, when you put a few features or topics in here, every prospect that goes through it would have a completely different experience. Right. right? And they're getting it uh, automatically tailored to them. And, and, and they also get these documents down here that are related, again, to the specific topics or features that they are right. indicating are most important to them. Does that make yeah. sense so far? Yeah, that's awesome. Because, I mean, people are going to do their research. Um, I was out at Google's offices in L.A., golly, it's been almost two years now. They had a presentation, and I'm sure the numbers have changed a little bit, but they, they said something like people visit like 8.7 sites or something before they make a decision. You know, and that's, I think that was even for like something simple, you know, like a, a TV or a computer. Right. Um, if something complex, you know, and you have four, five, six people on a team, man, they're probably hitting, you know, 50 websites all, all totaled. So, and I always say, you know, if you have to educate your prospects, but you have to have a system because if you just give them information and just hope, yeah, you're literally driving the business to your competition because they're going to take your info and then go to the next. And then by the time they get to that 8.7th, you know, uh, resource, yeah. whoever can engage them at that final point, um, they're going to win the sale. Yeah. Yeah. And what's beautiful about consensus is that internal champion can then just forward this demo on uh, to other people. And when they watch it, they also engage. And then what consensus does is it tracks what we call demo lytics behind the scenes and yep. drives all the data tracking back to the account executive. And then also actually back to the uh, internal champion as well. As I, I imagine you can see, uh, yeah, viewing time, number of times viewed, all that good stuff. That's right. Yeah. And so you can actually uh, drill down and look at some real specifics in terms of how people interact and what is driving uh, their specific interests. So is, is there any self-identifying info or like, can I forward this to my, you know, CFO and he can watch it anonymously or do they have to like log in and say, Hey, I'm Joe Smith, CFO of the sales whisperer. Yeah. What usually happens is the internal champion is going to actually share it in a way that they uh, invite the person through an email, but they can just forward it on if they want. Okay. And, and then that person can go in and, and check it out. Um, even when they forward it on uh, the system invites them to add their email and so on, but uh, they don't necessarily have to. Um, right. They, um, but it, but it uh, invites them to. And so it helps discover that, uh, that buying group. And nice. that's the challenge is when you're in B2B sales, you want to discover and engage that buying group early. Right. And what's interesting about consensus is when somebody watches a demo that's tailored to them personally, they share it 61% of the time with at least one other person in our platform, which is huge because then you start uh, engaging those different stakeholders and when they come to your conversations, again, we're not trying to replace conversations. What we're trying to do is make these sales conversations closing conversations and where you're really yeah. driving uh, into the specific values that the customers uh, need to So, do. So as I watch this, then I'd be like, whoa, I like it. And I could, so there'd be like a pop-up or something. I can just say, hey, Garen, check this out. And it, and it just sends it right away. That's right. That's right. Yep. You can, you can click the share button or it might invite you depending on a setting to just share it. Um, or you could just forward it on by email and when somebody clicks on the link, it'll invite them. And we use social capital to encourage people to add themselves. So if three people are already listed there, it might yeah. show you know, Wes and Garen are watching it. Uh, what's your name, right? Yeah. And that happens to generate quite a bit of, uh, of, of conversion there at that point. But, but now, so like if I forward, let's say I, I like them in order. You know, one is important, two is moderate, three is not. And I forward it to you you get to pick your own priorities, right? You could say, well, you know what? Three is very important to me and one is not. So do, right. do you, so it's kind of quizzing the whole infrastructure, the hierarchy. So I'm seeing, hey, the CEO likes one and two, the CFO likes two and three, and, and I can build that out. 
Exactly. So let me let me uh, show you here. Um, I'm just going to log into a, a different location here. So give me just a second. I'm going to show you some examples here. Yeah, that's awesome. Because you know, I've built my business that way by and, and stayed lean and mean because I've made demos. Uh, just through. 20 years of sales experience, you know, I, I see what's important, what isn't and right and approaching, uh, especially, you know, CRM sales, um, being an end user starting as a salesperson and not a geek. I had my own frustrations. So I, I would answer the questions or the objections or the confusion points. Yeah. And blog posts and demo videos, but I, you know, I would just throw it out to the world, right? I have a YouTube yeah. video, I SEO it, make a blog post, SEO it, share it on social media. So I could do this and I have done it like in an ad hoc way. Uh, but it did take a lot of time. It took a lot of understanding of, of sales and the product and on and on and on. So, I mean, I can see companies, Really, I mean, really, you only need a handful of really smart people to make this, and, and you can arm uh, a very large sales force with this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get you 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 build those initial assets, and they go to work for you. And the other challenge that we really haven't talked about, but is consi inconsistency between rep to rep. So you ha yeah, especially oh, yeah. When you're <laughs> you have all these new reps, and they're out there, and you have no idea what they're doing and how they're messaging and, and all of that. So that can help as well. I've seen that, especially sell, you know, I'm a reseller of a lot of different products. And yeah. so, but a lot of times the company, they have direct sales as well. And, and a lot of times my biggest competition is the direct sales team. Uh, and it's not that they're better salespeople, it's because they're worse salespeople and they say things they shouldn't say. They promise things yeah. they shouldn't promise, right? And I'm, I'm working on this right now with the guy. He has one product. He's already a client. He's looking at something else and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, hey, what are you going to do for a shopping cart? He's like, oh, that tool doesn't have a shopping cart? No. <laughs> you know, I'm like, stop talking to them. You know? <laughs> that dude just wants to make a sale. I'm going to help you. But, oh, it's, but it's like that guy because he – Either he doesn't know the customer like I do, and he yeah. doesn't because they've been in clients for four or five months, you know, or he doesn't understand their real business model. He just wants to make a sale. So I'm like, oh. So this could eliminate a lot of confusion and, and over, over really does. hyping, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it creates that messaging that's very consistent. Um, and so I wanted to show you kind of some of the we, – we have what's, what you would consider sort of tactical uh, demolytics that – to help you to close a specific deal. And then we have these aggregate demolytics that I want to show as well. So um, in this sample, you know, we've sent a demo to Wendy Stewart. She, she went and shared it with people. So if, if I go in and take a look at the different people she shared it with, you can see that um, here you can see the different people in the buying group. You can see their titles sometimes. You can see whether or not they watched it or, or not. Over here, you can see how much time they spent. Um, they may have spent multiple uh, gone in there multiple times and then you can see uh, what's driving their interests and compare and see where there's alignment or misalignment in the buying group. One of our customers said it's like having the answers to the test beforehand right? and um, because you get all this data coming in before you have those conversations. So we recommend that our, our customers send these demos out before the conversation. In fact, in an, in an account development situation, if somebody watches a consensus demo before the first conversation, they're 34% more likely to become a qualified opportunity. And if they watch it and share it with at least one other person, they're 81% more likely to become wow. a qualified opportunity. And so it's a, a, a way to really engage that buying group uh, earlier than ever before and shorten the sales cycle and, and increase the close rate. So who's entering that info, the, like the title? Do I do that when I share it or? Yeah, the, you're only going to get the title if you're sharing it with somebody and you want to put that in. And that okay. happens most often if you've, if you've already got a champion that's excited to go forward and uh, help drive the deal because they want you as the rep to kind of understand the buying group. Um, and, uh, and so if they're just forwarding it on um, or if they're just starting it to get engaged, they're less likely to put the title in. 
Right. But I see this as the salesperson, but the prospect doesn't see that I'm building this whole database on them, right? Um, they, they may or may, they may not. It depends on how you want to set it up because okay. we have what's called analytics for champions, meaning the internal champion. If you set that up, then you can actually uh, give the, the champion a link where they can come and see uh, exactly what's going on with the buying group as well because it helps them understand, oh, so-and-so right. watched it that I sent it to. And, and this is all tied in with notifications too. The, you'll get emails when people watch it. And really, again, it's, it's thinking about how the account executive and the champion have to tag team together. Right. And, and so we're giving tools not only to the account executive, but also to uh, the internal champion to go, to go sell. Yeah, that's cool. I, I mean, my, my concern would be just um, as a prospect, right? Let's say I'm, I'm on a, down there on the bottom. I log in. I'm like, whoa, they, they have all this intelligence on us internally, you know, uh, but so they don't necessarily see that. I mean, my champion, sure. The champion wants me to yeah. win, so I want to give him or her all types of information. Right. Yeah, it depends on how you set it up. Okay. Sometimes people want the team to to see it okay. because it's a transparent kind of conversation. And, and we prefer it that way because then you have this very transparent conversation with the customer saying, look, uh, CEO, you thought this was important. CMO, you thought this was unimportant. So uh, let's have a conversation. Why is that the case? Because unless you can have productive debate and, and the account executive really needs to lead that, you're, you're just going to run into problems later um, uh, when, you, when there's misalignment in the, in the buying group. And again, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So um, just wanted to also show you, uh, you can drill down on the specific uh, analytics for a, for a person here and see their, exactly what they watched, how many views they had, um, what their heat maps were, and so on. Oh, wow. Um, not sure why these heat maps are coming up a little slow here. Can I also see what movies he watched on Netflix? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it was po it populated. I saw the, yeah, it's just coming a little bit slow. Here's here we go. Finally came up. I think it's cause uh, I'm, I'm recording this session and my, my processors is getting a little overloaded, but, um, but yeah, so you can see all the different heat maps related to uh, yeah. what's driving their, their specific interest. So the green is where they watch, right? So like shortening the sales cycle, that person skipped ahead? Skipped some, yep. Yep, okay. It would show, if they watched it multiple times, it would show kind of a, a darker color as well. Okay. So you can imagine going into the sale and knowing that, oh, you know, to Wendy Stewart, shortening the sales cycle was really important. Uh, she went back and watched it again, right? She watched this much, skipped over some, and then went back and watched the whole thing, and uh, and so on. Oh, that's what the two rows mean. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that also is interesting is what you can do when you see uh, see the analytics as a whole. So this is our particular demo, and and our demo actually starts in what we call advanced branching personalization. In fact. Let me jump over to to uh, our demo here. And advanced branding personalization really targets the persona first and then the person. So what I've shown you right now so far is just targeting the person. They go in, they self-select. But there's another level above that where if you can ask them to self-select their persona, you can target that initial message just to the, their type of persona and then have them self-select exactly what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So um, let me uh, just show that to you here. Give me one second. Yeah, so I can still see um, the end user. Well, I mean, whoever orders this, needing some help around some of this content creation, right? Because yeah. how many times like on a customers do, do you see that they have this info and they just need to compile it versus some like don't have the assets and need to make a video or make better videos, make better content. Um, Cause I, I mean, based on my experience, most companies, you know, you have the product development team or the marketing team making some, BS type of content, really. 
uh-huh. um, that isn't that effective. Um, and I could see the opportunity for them, for me to come in and say, Hey, let me help you make better stuff, ask better questions, present it in a better light to really gotcha. leverage this. Yeah. We actually end up doing that for about, um, 80% of our customers. Oh, well. so, um, we engage in some consulting, but we have more importantly, we have implementation partners that are skilled at doing video production and screen recording production and things like that. There yeah. are tools embedded right in the platform for creating that content, but uh, how to do it effectively and all of that can, can be a little bit challenging for some customers at the beginning because they're not sure how to do it. Right. We help if they want to do it themselves. We also have ways that are, they can engage with external partners to right. uh, to be able to do that. Cool. So, um, so what I'm going to do is is show you first this uh, and pause the screen here. So. When, when you take our demo, and I'll send you one, a copy of this after, after the fact, you can experience it yourself, but instead of just starting out with a video, we actually ask this question, which role fits you best? And let's say I select sales, we're going to start with the intro video, it's actually branching out to a different demo right. for different um, personas. And this could be personas, it could be verticals, uh, or what have you. And and when you select sales, it's going to come up with the sales reality has changed a specific pitch about sales. And then at the end of that, which I won't go through the whole, the whole video here at the end of that, then it's going to ask those specific mm -hmm. uh, questions that I talked about. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. And what's brilliant about this is, is that it will actually double your conversion rate if you do the advanced branching uh, scenario, because uh, when you pitch to the specific persona or the specific vertical, uh, it's just even that much more personalized. And then they go in and select for themselves specifically what's driving driving their interests. So what if they? What if everything's important? Will it just go th go through all of them? It does. Yeah, it can. Okay. It'll, it'll go through all of them. Yeah. Okay. So and what I wanted to show you also is just these aggregate uh, demo lytics. Um, and that is that you can see, if we look at our platform, you can see out of the 2,800 views we've had in the last 30 days on our demo, 67% of them are sales oriented, 25% marketing and about 8% channel. And, and not only that, but you can get additional data analytics around your demo that normally you'd have to have a market research firm to, to get. So as an example, um, we use this for lead conversion on the website. Um, you can see that every converted lead spends over four minutes in our demo before we ever engage with them. That's a huge amount of qualification. Um, but even more interesting than that is when you go down and look at the specific demos that they, they went into. Let's say we go look at the sales persona demo and look at the feature set. <clears throat> The aggregate demo lytics for this particular demo, when people click sales, what are they marking is very important the most. And in, in, in about 2,000 views, um, right, what they're, what they're interested in most is converting leads at the four times the industry rate, sending and tracking demos. And you can see what's marked not important the most. So you can see how different value propositions are react, being reacted to in the marketplace. So that as sales leaders or marketing leaders, you can uh, – you can take that data and put it back into your messaging or emphasize different things. And we've had customers that have driven their conversion rate clear up from about 7% over 30% by using some of this data and feeding it back into, uh, into their, their messaging. Yeah, that's cool. So that gives you a quick overview of the platform. There's a lot more we could say, obviously, but um, let me jump back into some other concepts that I think uh, will be helpful. So what I was mentioning uh, there is, is that uh, really the branching where you start with that persona or the vertical and then it branches to some other uh, demo. And 
I want to share just a couple of experiences that our customers have had. Advanced MD was a division inside ADP when they had this and when they first implemented uh, consensus. And Advanced MD sells software into doctor's offices. And doctor's offices are difficult because doctors don't want to talk to you. Right. And you've got office administrators and nurses, and they all have to get in on purchase decisions. Um, they were selling you know, infrastructural software to doctor's offices. So in this example, he said, I sent con uh, the consensus demo to the billing manager, who sent it to the doctor, who watched it, who sent it to two others in the office, and the doctor loved it when, when he saw it and he did a brief, we did a brief live demo and it, and it sealed the deal. They closed right. the deal in just a couple of days. Yep. Overall, they shortened their sales cycle from 50 uh, days down to 16 days. So what they did, what was, I thought was really interesting at Advanced MD is they had 80 different sales reps and they did the split test across 90 days. They, they said, every other deal you do, you're gonna use consensus. And every other deal, you're not going to use consensus. And, uh, and these were the results that they found. At the end, the, the, the deals they used consensus with closed at a 44% higher close rate than the others. Right. And, um, and that even surprised us. We thought there might be a 10 to 15% increase in the close rate. This was early in our business. So uh, it's just really powerful results. So just wanted to emphasize that this isn't just about um, – having a good way to engage or whatever it actually is discovering and engaging that buying group earlier shortens that sales cycle. And then because it's personalized, you're much more likely to get the deal done um, because you're personalizing your, your pitch and your messaging and all of that to uh, each stakeholder in the buying group. Right. Well, it makes sense. I mean, this is a classic example. I mean, I, I'm teaching a course right now um, called the art of the close. Yeah. And, and I tell people all the time, it, as sellers, it's our job to adjust our selling style to match the buying style, the buying preferences of our customers. Right. right. We can't go in. It's not a one size fits all. Right. Here's right. my style. Here's my PowerPoint. Here's my brochure. You're going to read all of it and then you're going to buy when I'm done. It's like, and this is how people consume data now. This is how they get educated. Right. And yeah. so it just, it makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Most people do hours upon hours of education before they engage with the sales rep. Right. And, um, and so this really has a dramatic impact um, because it's not – a lot of people will send out white papers or what have you. Um, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's really about um, helping the buyer buy more effectively. Right. So if we look at the proliferation of technology – in the sales enablement space over the last several years, it's just incredible how much is proliferated. Right. And um, and I just want to show a slide here that I think will be interesting. So you look at all the sales enablement space, but who is enabling the buyer? And that's really where are you? <laughs> right. Yeah. And not to say that sales enablement isn't helpful. We use a lot of these great tools. But the point is that if all you're doing is enabling the sales rep, you're not enabling at least half of the equation. Probably more than half of the equation is, is the buying group. Right? right. And so that's really our focus. Very so cool. Hopefully that's helpful. That's, that's uh, the main thing I wanted to share with you and your audience today. And I really appreciate having the opportunity. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, I'm kind of taking a quick note there. I love that slide. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, this is great. Yeah, I will. Uh, so I've taken some notes. I'm going to share this. Uh, you know, we'll link uh, to to your site, of course. Uh, so how how did you come about? You know, maybe just a quick minute or two. How how did this evolve? I mean, what what's kind of the backstory there? Yeah, it's it's interesting. My um, in my last startup, I'm a serial entrepreneur. In my last startup, we were selling B two B software B two B. And we were constantly doing demos. And one day I did six demos in a row and I really just did the same thing, but changed it up based on what the unique interests were of, of the buyer. Yep. And I just was so exhausted and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? This should be more automated, right? Yep. I just did almost the same thing six times in a row. And I changed it because I'm going to try to adjust to each buyer's unique interests. And, and so I started thinking, after I sold that company, I was just thinking about what, what new things could I do to help the sales process and, right. and marketing as well. And I started thinking about, well, 
you know, this interaction of the, what we call the demo is such a rich interaction normally. Is there a way you could automate that? Yeah. And, and what's involved in a demo? Well, in a demo, you're typically asking questions. You're adjusting your pitch based on the questions. You're trying to discover the buying group and different stakeholders. And then, and then you've got to bring them in and you've got to pitch to them and adjust your pitch to them yep. and, and really try to work everybody in the buying group. And, I, and so I just started thinking, well, what if we could automate some of that um, right. with video and documents? And I started looking around and there, there really wasn't anything out there. In fact, we tried doing it in my last startup by putting some videos on YouTube and things like that. But the point is you have no way to track it right. based on the person and especially as a group. Even if you can track a video by a person, how do you track how they're doing it in the group? And then, and then a video itself, like we'd post these webinars over 45 minutes and say, hey, watch this link. Well, who wants to watch a 45-minute right. video from end to end um, without some way to personalize it? I mean, sometimes it's worth it. Um, but, but if you really want to get to the, the, the ability to reach into the specific needs of the customer and keep them engaged, it's got it's to dynamically personalize it. Right. So I went out and just talked to 30 different SaaS companies and said, hey, because that was my our initial target market uh, thinking. And I said, hey, if we built something like this, and I showed them a bunch of sketches, well, 77% of them said, yeah, we would definitely buy something like this if it were available. Yeah. So, um, so that, that was kind of the early validation. Yeah. Well, it's, it's true. I, um, I'm always telling people, look at what you do two or three times a day or four or five times a week, and at a minimum have a process for that and preferably automate it. Right. You know, so that's in the whole sales and marketing automation space. Um, and so this, I mean, just fits right in because you're right. I was, I've done those six demos in a row. Yeah. You know? <laughs> just like I want to poke my eye out with a pen, you know, like, exactly. I have to do this again. You know? right. One more time, every, you know, over yeah. and over. And, and of course it's worth doing if you don't have any other option, but really what you should be doing in those conversations is drilling down on what is what they really need, the qu specific questions they have, and how you can implement a solution that actually drives value for them. Right. And, and if they can come to that initial conversation fully educated, like, like I was saying, the leads that come to our conversation in our own company have already watched over four minutes of interactive video content so they're highly educated about our solution by the time we engage with them. So it really helps shorten our own sales cycle. Uh, so who's an ideal user for this? I mean, it seems like a one person company could use this and, you know, a bazillion size company could use this. Yeah, it's true. And it's been one of the challenges for us trying to figure out who our ideal customer profile is. Because when I started this company, I thought I was initially targeting thinking, oh, this is going to be for other startups. And it definitely helps. We have a lot of startups, you know, using it, other small companies. But very early on, we saw interest and actually valuable results from larger companies. And as you can see from this slide, we, we have companies such as HPE and Oracle and Microsoft all using it. And, and when I designed this initially, I really wasn't really thinking that. But as we've engaged in the market the last two and a half years, uh, it's been remarkable to see what kinds of results that these companies can have. Um, right now, uh, you know, I would say uh, one of the, you can definitely use it uh, as a single, you know, kind of a, a sole proprietor. Um, it's especially effective when you've got a, a team of people um, to use it on the sales side, but a lot of our customers also use it on the marketing side to just generate highly qualified leads. And what you're going to get there is our, we have over 75% of our customers, it's actually like 75.7% of our customers have over a 7% conversion rate uh, on their demo. So if they drive leads on the marketing use case, and that's like three times the industry standard. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at research, the average landing page conversion rate is about 2.3%. And, um, and so even if you're a small company, you can use it for lead generation and to send demos and track them. Um, but the large companies, you look at what's happening at Renaissance Learning, which is a, a larger mid-market company in, in Madison, Wisconsin. You know, on the marketing side, they're getting 30% plus conversion rates on lead gen. And on the sales side, 
they are getting about a 50% close rate, whereas before it was about a 35% close rate. And so, um, and they've got 150 sales reps. And so it's, uh, it can really be used across the board. But, um, you know, right now we're, we're targeting as a company other software companies, but uh, we've got um, other customers in other verticals. But so far, the main vertical that we're going after is software just because that's the space we know the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Congratulations. This is well, fantastic. You. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a fun ride. We've got a good team here, and, uh, and it's been fun to see this solution that I was just kind of dreaming up as a, as a way to try to help solve the, own, the same the problems I had in sales and marketing actually generating right. some value. Yeah, let's say it's um, turn your misery into your ministry, huh? <laughs> That's true, yep. <laughs> Make your mess your message. <laughs> oh, man. All right, very nice. Garen Hess, CEO and founder of Consensus, all the way from Utah, man. Thanks for coming on the CRM Sushi Podcast. It's been great. Hey, thanks, Wes. It's been great talking to you.